board. Okay. All right, I'm just going to give it a minute just to make sure. Sure. Anyone that wants to come in comes in. Hello, everybody. Hi, Ted. Uh, hey, Scott, Misty, Jenny. Hello. Hello. Hi. All right, guys. Um, just a few little, um, not rules, but preferences, I guess. Um, before we get started, if this is your first educational webinar that you're joining us on, welcome. Um, we ask that everyone just mute themselves, just so there's not any background noise that comes in during the presentation. Um, and hold all questions until the end, or you can kind of scroll down at the bottom and just put the questions in the chat box, and Jenny or I will make sure that those get asked. Um, I want to go ahead and introduce Scott Baraban. He is a professor of neurological surgery and William K. Bose Jr. Endowed Chair in Neuroscience Research at the University of California, San Francisco. He is also a member of the DSF Scientific Advisory Board. Um, so we're excited to have you here, Scott, and you can take it away. Great. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I wanted to start, I norm normally don't like to uh, be political, but um, I wanted to start with just a moment of silence, given what's going on in our country with over 100,000 people dead um, from COVID as well as the Black Lives Matters movement. So I'm gonna go black for a few seconds and then I'll start my, my, um, my, my talk. Okay. Okay, I think my screen sharing is disabled. Um, Jenny, I'm we'll trying to that. screen share, but it says it's host disabled attendee screen sharing. Okay, hold on one second. Let me get that fixed. Okay, thanks. Sorry. No problem. I'm sorry, just give me a minute. I'm not finding where it is and it could be maybe because we already have a co-host. I don't know. Hold on one second. There it goes. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, again, thanks uh, everyone for tuning in. Um, I'm going to try to um, go over some of the research we've been doing here over the last decade. Almost uh, or everything I'm going to show you is published. So if you want more information, I can direct you at the end to, to where the details are in the published uh, uh, papers based on this work. And so I want to talk today about discovery and development of new therapies for Dravet syndrome using uh, zebrafish models. I want to start with uh, disclosures, of course. Um, I'm, as mentioned, I am a scientific advisory board member um, for the Dravet Syndrome Foundation for about a, a decade now. I also consult and serve on the SAB for a contract research organization called Z Clinics in Barcelona, Spain. And I'm the co-founder and scientific advisory board director for a, a company called Epigenics Therapeutics that's commercializing some of these discoveries I'm going to talk to you about. First, of course, um, so I don't forget, I wanna uh, start by acknowledging a very talented team of uh, postdocs and, and undergrads and technicians who've worked on this project in recent years. 
uh, led by Alicia Griffin, uh, who moved on to Synthigo, a company called Synthigo, and Colleen Carpenter, who's currently directing this project. Uh, Jin Liu is also a, a talented postdoc who worked on this, who's back in China in a startup company, and both Maya and Chin Windu, who are now uh, technicians in the lab helping with the project as well uh, for Team Zebrafish. So for those of you who don't know, don't know about my laboratory, we have been here at UCSF a little over 20 years now. We're an epilepsy-based laboratory, uh, mostly on translation research. And though today I'm only going to talk to you about our zebrafish projects, we also work on mice and other, other kinds of organisms for cell transplantation therapies. And that's a separate topic, of course. Today I want to focus on our zebrafish projects, which offer many advantages for in vivo analysis of gene function, such as uh, STN1 mutations, and as you'll see, for high throughput drug screening and other types of translational work that would allow us to, to identify new therapies. So one of the problems, and this is kind of where I want to start, is that the available anti-epileptic drugs that exist, and there are about 28 that are FDA approved drugs that have been on the market going back to the 1850s, all or were discovered using acute seizure models and largely in rodents. And the problem with this is that even though 28 different AEDs exist, the percentage of epilepsy patients that are effectively managed by these available AEDs hasn't really changed in over 50 years. And I think one of the reasons this happens is that these models do not model spontaneous seizures or really what we define as epilepsy. They're acutely induced seizures in healthy animals. And more importantly, in the context of Dravet syndrome and other types of pediatric disorders, genetic disorders, they don't target genetic epilepsies. So none of these 28 drugs were discovered using an approach that focused on a genetic form of epilepsy. The other problem, of course, is because these are rodent models and sometimes even cats uh, and, and uh, rabbits, they're very low throughput. So you can only test a few drugs at a time. And of course, that's a very costly and labor intensive approach. So what's an alternative? Well, we believe zebrafish are an, uh, an attractive alternative, and I'll show you why. This, of course, has been recognized in some recent uh, Nature Reviews um, review articles that focus on zebrafish as tools for drug discovery. First kind of such paper came out in 2015 by Randy Peterson, who was at the, uh, who was at the University of Utah, and it discussed some of the early efforts at that time to use translational models developed in zebrafish to find new drugs. More recently, Megan Cully came back and, re and reviewed this topic in greater depth now that several drugs, including ours, which was featured in that article, are moving toward the clinic. And uh, as finally making the point that zebrafish are an attractive alternative for drug discovery types of projects, not just ours, but for many types of diseases. So why do I use zebrafish? Well, there's a number of reasons, and they're, they're all kind of um, specifically advantageous for the type of research I'm going to show you. First and foremost, zebrafish are vertebrates. Um, and, uh, they're a little higher up in, in the phylogenetic chain than something like Drosophila or worms. They have between 70 and 84% identity with human genomes, with the human genome. For disease-based genes, it's usually 80% and more. And that's uh, even higher than, than in many mouse models. They're very inexpensive to maintain. This little inset shows you a zebrafish larvae, which is about the size of your eyelash, but they come from adult fish that are about one or two um, centimeters in length, type of fish you see in the pet store. And so basically we just maintain them in large scale aquaria or tanks. Most importantly, they're genetically tractable. That is, we can modify their genetics either to knock out genes or knock in genes. What you see on the right actually is a reporter fish where you can see different types of neurons in the brain labeled with either red or green reporters. And in the case that we're going to show you, we're going to talk to you about an SCN1 mutant fish that has a loss of function. Most importantly for drug discovery, two features. First, that adult pairing um, can lay up to one or 200 eggs. And so every, every week they can do this. And so you can get hundreds of, of fish for experiments each week. And because they're larvae, larvae and they don't yet have scales, Whatever the fish is swimming in, they'll absorb through their skin. So it's very easy to do drug delivery, as long as the drug is water soluble. And so when we think about animal models, we have to kind of consider how they um, come to be and whether they're actually useful. And I often think of this, whether it's a, a, a mouse model or, or a fish model or even organoids, that they'd have to fit three very specific features um, to be valid. First, a good model would have to have construct validity. 
that means it has the same causal mechanism of the disease that you're trying to model in humans, in this case, an SCN1 mutation. Secondly, and very importantly, it has to have face validity. That is, the animal that has this gene mutation would have to recapitulate as many of the phenotypes that you see in patients with that disease. And finally, and mostly imp most important for drug discovery, we want the model to have predictive validity. That is, if you give drugs that people with that disease actually take, do you see the same responses in that animal model? So I'm gonna step you through some of those features very, very quickly to show you why we use this model in the first place and what its value is. First and foremost, this is a zebrafish model for an SCN1 gene mutation that's 83% similar to the human mutation. It's expressed in the central nervous system. You can see the little, the head of the fish uh, marked in purple here where, to show you where the gene is expressed. And most importantly, it's a loss of function in a voltage activated sodium channel. So when this gene mutation is expressed in oocytes, you can see that there's no sodium current. So it has construct validity. The same reasons or causal reasons that patients have Dravet syndrome linked to SCN1 mutations. Next, it has behavior that looks like a seizure. So if you just put one of these larvae in a single well of a 96 well plate, so for context, this is on a microscope and it's imaged at high resolution <clears throat> and it's imaged at a very high speed, 100 hertz or 100 frames per second. And then what we're doing is we're slowing down the video so you can see these very severe convulsive movements that these fish are having spontaneously. Again, these are not induced seizure events. These are spontaneous seizure events, which is similar to what patients with epilepsy have. They are full body convulsions and they start very early in development around the third day of life. And Importantly for us, for the types of experiments we do, you can easily track these types of movements using a camera and get a quantitative readout of a fish having a seizure versus a fish just normally meandering around the, around the well. Again, normal wild type fish or control fish would never have this type of convulsive behavior, no matter how long you watch them. Second and most important for epilepsy, because epilepsy in the end in the clinic is defined as an abnormal electrographic event the fish have abnormal EEG events. Again, these are spontaneous. They're easily recorded by just putting an electrode in the brain of the zebrafish that's either embedded in agarose or in one of our, our special multi-fluidic multi chambers. And then we just record activity. And you can see over this 15 minute trace that you have both interictal or brief uh, events, uh, smaller amplitude and large multi-spike events followed by a period of what would be considered post-ictal depression. So again, this is an abnormal EEG, and it corresponds to those behavioral events you see spontaneously. Again, normal fish would just have a flat uh, EEG for most of this trace. And if we image activity in the brain, this is a, a zebrafish larvae we're expressing something called a genetically coded calcium indicator. It allows us to see which neurons in the brain light up at any given time. And what you can see when the seizure event occurs, whether it's through this light sheet microscopy, which is a volumetric imaging, allowing us to look at every neuron in the brain of the zebrafish, or this faster confocal imaging in one plane. You, and to, sorry, to orient, this is the front of the fish. This is where the eyes would be, and the bottom is the, where the tail would be. Importantly, these spontaneous seizure-like events are generalized. That is, the whole brain lights up at the same time. And there's CNS origin. That is, you can see the activity first in the brain before it travels down to the spinal cord. So face validity is important. This model has behavioral seizures, it has electrographic seizures, and it has generalized seizure events. But what about construct validity in terms of comorbidities? So the issue here is that, as many of you know, patients with Dravet syndrome don't just have seizures. They have a number of other comorbidities that are also problematic. Some of them can be modeled in fish, and some of them are actually reproduced by our mutant uh, larvae. They're listed here. They have an oculomotor deficit. They have a sleep disturbance, which is shown on the left. This is basically uh, fish in one well, kind of moving around during a light or daytime. Lights go off, they stop moving, which is the green line. And then you turn them on and they start moving again. And you can see very clearly the mutant larvae move more at night. So they have trouble basically falling asleep in this assay, similar to children with Dravet syndrome. We've also shown with Manisha Patel's lab at the University of Colorado that our larvae have a, have a metabolic deficit, which is again common in pediatric epilepsies, and they have early fatality. The larvae I'm going to talk to you about don't live past about 14 days of age. But what about, most importantly for a drug discovery program, 
predictive validity. That is, if we give drugs that your children take as a standard of care, do they actually make seizures better or, or, or eliminate seizure events in these fish? And if we give drugs they're not supposed to take, do they make seizures worse or don't work at all? That is, are they pharmacoresistant? If you look clear, carefully at the left, it shows you kind of what we know clinically about the different available anti-epileptic drugs, whether they work or, or, or uh, somewhat or not. And then you can see if you match up with the fish, that the FISH model, and this is based on both behavioral data, looking at the drugs on that convulsive behavior and EEG activity. So drugs that are normally standard of care, like benzodiazepines, uh, steropentol, topiramate, valproate, potassium bromide, those are all effective in reducing seizure activity in our mutant model. And drugs that don't work in patients, carbamazepine, gabapentin, et cetera, also don't work in our zebrafish model. This is interesting because it suggests that the model is predictive of what might occur if we discover a new drug. And indeed, when we tested experimental drugs, we also found that fenfluramine, and as you'll see, some synthetic cannabin can cannabinoids are also effective. In contrast, when you look at spontaneous seizures in a Dravet mouse, this is from Jennifer Kearney's lab, you see it's not very good at predicting whether a drug matches up with the clinical data. In fact, they were only able to pick out no's. They couldn't find any drugs that actually worked and the predictive ability was about 57% versus 100. Importantly, as a caveat, it's very difficult to study spontaneous seizures in mice. It's much more labor intensive, and it's much harder to test different ranges of drugs. So in Jennifer's defense, this might be a preliminary kind of look at the pharmacology of these animals. But what it does show is that we can very rapidly get this type of profile for a mutant fish that we can't get from a mouse, and that the mutant very accurately predicts drugs that are used clinically. So, now I want to take you through the drug development process. And many of you kind of have heard little parts of it, and it's a kind of complicated kind of slide, but I'm going to step through each of the steps of how we get from finding a drug all the way to the clinic. As many of you know, this is an expensive process. It's estimated for that drug development usually costs about $2.6 billion per drug. And the time is usually somewhere between 10 and 15 years to get from the beginning of this process all the way to the end. So I want to start with where we jumped in, which is the exploratory research phase. Basically, we had the zebrafish mutant. We knew it responded to certain drugs that patients take and didn't respond to other AEDs that it doesn't. So we said, what if we could use this to find new lead compounds? And the difference with what we do versus what other has, others have done in the drug discovery kind of field is that we did this in a completely unbiased manner. This was not that we had a target and we wanted to hit that target. We basically screened any drugs we can get our hands on, all blinded, not knowing what they are, and hope to see something that changed the phenotype. So this is a phenotype-based screening approach. Basically, we're looking for drugs that stop the fish from seizing. The way we do this is twofold, because there's potential for both um, false positives and you want to be as high throughput and accurate as possible. So using the behavioral readout, which allows us to just simply stick a mutant in one well, of, of a, a 96 well plate and record its activity, we can test drugs very rapidly to see whether those convulsive behaviors are reduced back to normal by the addition of a drug. Of course, that has its caveats. The biggest being a drug that's both sedative or a muscle relaxant would also stop the fish from having that convulsive behavior. But the advantage of our project or approach is that we have a second stage to confirm that the electrographic activity is actually suppressed by the drug. Only an anti-epileptic drug would block seizure events. A muscle relaxant, a sedative would not have that effect. So by having a two-stage process, we're able to rapidly screen drugs and then very carefully pick out those that are truly anti-epileptic by blocking seizure activity. Again, spontaneous seizure activity that occurs in these mutant larvae. So what does the data look like? Well, this is a rough um, kind of estimate of all the drugs we've studied so far. If you want a full list, and I get this question a lot of times from people when new drugs come about or papers come out and someone says, oh, this drug is an FDA approved drug or this is a new drug that we found our, our mouse model or, or whatever, Dravet syndrome, you can go to our database, which is on our website, and see whether we've already tested that drug. 90% of the time we've already tested it and, it, and and these drugs are not positive. The only drugs that are positive are actually the ones I'm going to show you in a few minutes. So this is just a cumulative data that shows you all the different library routes we've screened to date. It's about 3,500 compounds. It includes FDA-approved compound libraries, synthetic cannabinoid libraries, 
and various natural products libraries and a variety of other libraries as well. From these 3,500 drugs, we only have a handful of hits and all of those hits seem to have a similar mechanism of action. The first lead compound and the one we're most excited about still to this day is something called clemazole. This was discovered in uh, 2013 or first reported by us in 2013. Clemazole was a, uh, a drug um, that was in the literature as an antihistamine, but it was not known to have any anti-epileptic activity. What we found using our assay is it reduced the swim activity back to normal and it completely blocked or suppressed the electrographic seizure discharges, whether we used our single field, local field potential recordings or so a device we developed called an iZap, which allows us to record many fish at the same time. As an as a example of what a false positive looks like, zoxisolamine is on here. It also suppressed the seizure behavior, but because this is a muscle relaxant, it had no effect on the EEG activity. And this is how we, again, figure out what are false positives versus true anti-seizure drugs. So what is clemazole? Well, it turned out clemazole was a first generation antihistamine uh, anti first discovered in the 1950s. It um, was subsequently replaced by second generation antihistamines anti and was dropped from the market sometime in the 1970s. It shows a rel relatively low order of toxicity in the original reports and there was no actually negative side effects that we could find in the literature related to clemazole administration. Interestingly, antihistamines, as you might know, are contraindicated for pediatric epilepsies. And indeed, the 70 odd other antihistamines in our drug screening library, none of them were anti-epileptic. So clemazole had to be doing something else to induce this anti-seizure effect. And that takes us to the second step of our drug development process. Now that we have a candidate drug, we want to optimize it. We want to make derivatives of it and see if that will tell us something about that drug and its mechanism of action. To do this, we collaborated with medicinal chemists here at UCSF, and basically taking the structure of clemazole, we modified it in different ways to make analogs of clemazole to see if any of them could reproduce this anti-seizure effect. We then put them through the same process of anti-seizure screening in the locomotion assay, electrophysiology assay, and then finally, we tried some binding studies to see the mechanism of action, and I'll get to that in a minute. Basically, what does a drug bind to in the brain? Lead optimization led us to generate 28 different derivatives of clemazole and then screen them. And what we found, which confirms that clemazole is not working through an antihistamine effect, is that we found three more compounds that were slight change, that had slight changes on the clemazole structure that produced the same anti-epileptic effect. Here, I'm just showing you the electrophysiology, but the behavioral readout was very similar. And so these clemazole analogs all reproduced the same anti-seizure effect that the original drug clemazole did. So we've optimized our lead compound. We now have four drugs that all suggest that this type of molecule is anti-seizure, has anti-seizure effects in a Dravet syndrome uh, zebrafish model. So then we actually went back to the beginning, what some, some consider the beginning of this process, which was target discovery. So we discovered a drug in an unbiased manner using phenotype-based screening. We then made derivatives of the drug to see if those would also work. Now with those tools in hand, we went back to see what do these drugs bind to. Uh, I don't know why I did that. So this process is to use uh, basically uh, a binding assay. Without getting into the details, it tells us what in the brain or what a cell this drug is binding to. And of course, H1 receptors, histamine receptors were very high, but we also found that serotonin receptors and some other uh, uh, G protein coupled and ion channel receptors are also binding to this drug. So we reverse engineered our project and we went back and screened libraries that had all these different compounds in them. And from that assay, which is about two, I think about 100 drugs total, we discovered two more drugs, trazodone and lorcaserin. These are also FDA approved drugs and they're from repurposed drug libraries as well. Trazodone is a sleep medicine and lorcaserin was on the market initially as a weight loss medicine. What we found is all, all, both of those drugs, as well as our clemaz clemazole derivatives, all bind to a serotonin 2B receptor, which is what we think now is our target for how it works. The advantage of having repurposed drugs, uh, which I didn't really dwell on at the front, but makes sense here, is that if you have a rep repurposed drug, it's already FDA approved and for some other indication, and so it could already be used off-label in the clinic. This allowed us to look at our three drugs, clemazole, trazodone, and lorcaserin, 
and decided to do a proof of concept, some proof of concept clinical trials to see if they actually worked. The important thing is we went right from this zebrafish database to humans. There's no mouse studies, there's no organoid studies, there's nothing in between. And we started with a project with Kelly Nupp at the Children's Hospital in Colorado to repurpose lorcaserin. Lorcaserin was our initial choice because it had a better safety profile in children versus trazodone. Clemazole, which I'll tell you about at the end, was not available because no one was commercially making Clemazole, so it's not available in the market anymore to use. So Kelly selected, Dr. Nupp selected five Dravacinib patients, all with confirmed SCN1A mutations, and in a 20-week trial, they were administered lorcaserin between about 0.19 and 0.27 milligrams per day, so a very low dose. They were all pharmacoresistant, and they were all um, um, basically between, I think, the ages of 5 and 15, if I remember correctly, or 5 and 17. And the only side effect we saw was decreased appetite, which is what you'd expect because this is an anti-obesity drug. And amazingly, what we saw in this small sampling, this proof of concept study, is that there was a significant decrease in the number of spontaneous seizures that these patients had during the three months of treatment. Four patients had between 50 and almost 100% seizure reduction during that time. One patient had no change. If you look at this as a group, this fares very well with both early CBD trials that have been published, steropentol, as well as fenfluramine. And more importantly, a couple years later, Oren Davinsky's group, completely independent of, of us at NYU, looked at retro, retroactive uh, charts to see what, which of his Dervais patients were taking lorcaserin. Of those patients he found that were on lorcaserin, he noted an almost 50% reduction in their seizures as well. So that's two groups in, independent of each other showing that lorcaserin, which is one of our serotonin drugs, had some anti-seizure uh, possibilities in patients with Dervais syndrome. The other proof of concept comes from a group in uh, Portugal that was published a year, uh, in 2018. This is an N of one study, which I don't always recommend because N of one is going to be a little bit misleading, but nonetheless, it shows some promising, promising early results that incorporate EEG data. So basically they took a 25 year old with an SCN1 mutation who had been treated with many different anti-epileptic drugs, but had no seizure free periods or significant seizure reductions. And they found after treatment with trazodone, there was a considerable reduction in the number of these epileptiform-like events, and that the patient had no generalized tonic-clonic seizures, and of course, sleep improvement, because this is a sleep aid as well. So together, this shows that two of the drugs we discovered, again, only in zebrafish, never tested in any other model, went right from our studies into patients with Dervais syndrome with some promising early results. So where are we now? So around this time, around 2017 or so, we uh, spun out a company uh, called Epigenics Therapeutics to develop these compounds for the market. They're a precision medicine company for rare forms of genetic epilepsies. And you'll hear a little bit more about them in a few weeks when they give their own presentation. But I just wanna give you a teaser of where we are. Basically, we've now developed um, several um, hits that were that, you know, in the pipeline. Um, Clemazole being the top um, compound we're, we're looking at. We've synthesized Clemazole. We've made it into a pediatric formulation, basically an oral formulation. And we completed phase one studies last year with no adverse side effects at all. And we're just beginning phase two studies with results anticipated in the fall on a relatively small group of patients through a company called uh, Greenlight Clinical, I believe. And so we should know uh, by the end of the year whether Clemazole shows some efficacy in patients with Dravet syndrome and uh, we'll be looking at LGS as well. We have our Clemazole analogs as well. They're back in the pipeline because they're what, they're, they're what are called NCEs or new chemical entities, so they need a little more research. And then we, of course, have some ongoing proof of concept studies, both in our hands and other groups with both lorcaserin and trazodone. So that kind of completes uh, my little summary of what we've been doing. Uh, it's very important to point out that even though this is a very complex process to develop new drugs, we believe that using zebrafish models that can be well validated as models of human epilepsies, we can shorten this process. And indeed, this project started in about 2013, and it's only 2020, and we're on the verge of getting close to FDA approval for these types of compounds, hopefully in the next year or two.
So I just want to end there. Thank, of course, the Dravet Syndrome Foundation, the Cure Foundation, and NIH for supporting this research over the last decade. And just some uh, sites if you want to go to hear more about us. Our website, of course, has the database of drugs we've discovered. As many know, um, where the lab is active on Twitter, often commenting on, on science and other types of topics. And if you need to reach me directly, you can just write to me at my UCSF address. And with that, I think I'll take questions. Perfect. Thank you, Scott. If anyone has any questions, you can just unmute yourself and it seems to go pretty well that way. If not, you can hover down below above chat and type them in there and Jenny and I can um, read them out for you. Scott, this is Ted. Um, mm -hmm. On one of your slides, hi, how you doing? I'm, good presentation. Good. Uh, one of your slides you had that you showed uh, positive uh, uh, efficacy with zebrafish for fenfluramine and CBD. Could you comment a little bit further on, on that? And especially uh, as it relates to, uh, to uh, Belvic, the uh, fact that it's also a weight loss drug. Yeah, so fenfluramine is a serotonin reuptake um, drug that uh, Zogenix is developing, as many know. Um, in one of our papers in 2016, we had reported that it had anti-epileptic effect on our assays. Uh, we also published um, just this last month or two, the synthetic cannabinoid library. We could not directly test cannabidiol because I my laboratory doesn't have a schedule one license or, or a collaboration with uh, GW Pharma. But when we looked at synthetic versions, we found I think five or six synthetic cannabinoids that were also anti-epileptic. And so in general, it just highlights the efficacy of our assays to identify drugs that are actually used clinically and have relevance, either experimental drugs or AEDs. Uh, it's important to point out these are not comparisons. This is a yes or no type of assay. We make, we make no kind of comparisons of a drug is better or worse than another. Basically, we simply set a high bar for a hit. A uh, drug has to have almost you know, complete suppression of EEG activity and more than 50% reduction in the seizure behavior consistently over many trials. And so we view this as a yes, no assay. Uh, questions on things like concentration or comparing the drugs, I think, are best left to clinical types of studies. Animal models don't really predict that, and I wouldn't really recommend people taking that approach anyway. Right. Thank you. Sure. Scott, we have a few questions in the chat room. Um, I'll start off with, why were you not required to test the drug in non-human primates before going to the patients? Because we only used uh, clinically approved, previously FDA approved drugs. And so there's no reason um, to do that. This is not, a, these are not new, novel chemical entities or gene therapies that have never been tested in humans. These are drugs that actually have been in clinical practice because the FDA has already approved them. Uh, that means, of course, that someone else has already done those types of safety studies. For clemazole, for our own purposes and to, to, to kind of be safe, because it was discovered in the 50s, we repeated all of those preclinical and uh, early phase one human studies on safety just for our own purposes to, to make it stronger. So the clemazole data, which is why we've been quiet on this for a few years, we spent a couple of years studying it in uh, dogs and rodents, et cetera, to make sure it's safe. And then we spent another six months doing phase one trials in healthy, uh, healthy patients to make sure it's safe before we proceed with clinical trials. I think it's very important to point out and I know it's hard to hear because of the timeline of, of how devastating Dravet can be and how early it hits kids, that you have to take very cautious steps when developing new therapies. It's very hard to jump directly from what is a new kind of potentially drug into a patient without knowing a lot about its safety first. And so for us, we've uh, emphasized safety over, uh, I guess, a speed at all steps of the process once we discover the drug. Okay, um, let's see. Can you use the zebrafish model to test treatments for non-convulsive seizures in Dravet? For non-convulsive seizures, if they have an electrical signature, yes. Um, if you just base it on behavior, um, clearly no, because a non-convulsive seizure behavior would just look like a normal animal. Um, we do have uh, models where we have different electrical patterns, and so that is possible. Um, and it's not something uh, we've done uh, a lot of work on so far, but it's certainly possible if, again, there's an electrical signature for that non-convulsive seizure. 
Okay, another one was, um, how did you determine the clemazole dose in your study with Dr. Nup? Um, so it was lorcaserin, uh, to be uh, first. Um, we, not clemazole for the Dr. Nup studies. Um, uh, Kelly, uh, I looked at what was available in terms of uh, safety studies for lorcaserin in children, and then basically went up from there. I think it started around point two point one or something per day, and then she, she went up uh, until it got to about 0.32 milligrams per day, I think is the highest dose we did. But it was based on other Lorcaserin pediatric data. Admittedly, there wasn't much because you don't really give weight loss drugs to kids. Um, so it was really Kelly's call. Uh, for Clemazole, we've done, we're doing, uh, the clinical trials are designed to test a uh, low dose and then ramp up. Um, we already know the safety range, which is very large um, for Clemazole. So we have a big window for those studies that are, that are about to start right now. Okay, there was one more that I missed, um, and I'm totally going to butcher this, but it says, have you tested any immune treatments such as Anna Kenra? Am I saying that right? And help me out here, Jenny. Do you see that one? Uh, yeah. Uh, Why did you give me the worst one? Uh, mm -hmm. T-O-C-I-I-Z-U-M-A-B. How about that? Tocilizumab? I don't know what that is. Um, I, I would say probably. Um, the many, there are many immuno uh, type. Uh, there, the library of 3,500 drugs contains basically every mechanism of action on earth. And so um, it's covered, uh, it, it, it's covered probably the type, I, I don't know off the top of my head because I haven't memorized that list. Um, and I can look it up after we're done. If it's not on a list, drugs like it were probably tested. Uh, uh, and failed. They, basically, I am, of the 3,500 drugs, only about five or six work, and they're all serotonin drugs. I, I basically showed you everything that works. Any other possibility you think might exist, we've already tested and didn't work. Um, that doesn't mean in other concentrations and other assays, you know, we might pull something out. But again, we were looking for things that were very effective in suppressing seizures, not modestly effective, not statistically significantly effective, but eliminated the seizure event. So we set a very high bar for our hits. The other point, which is worth uh, mentioning, is immune type, you know, drugs that block the immune response that you see with epilepsy, that's more of an acquired epilepsy kind of concept. In, in a genetic epilepsy, you have a, a gene mutation that immediately causes you to have seizures. Um, in acquired epilepsy, there's a process of epileptogenesis, and that's where kind of immune response comes in, and that's where some of those drugs have shown to be effective in acquired forms of epilepsy. Um, that said, again, we didn't find any other types of drugs or any other types of classes of compounds other than what I showed you. There's one more on here. Uh, what is the number of fish needed to expose to validate a drug? Yeah, great question. Um, so our initial high throughput assay um, is statistically significant at, we do six fish uh, per drug um, per experiment. Um, that's just a first pass. If a drug works, we repeat it again on a separate clutch of fish, uh, again, six fish. If a drug works twice, we then uh, unblind ourselves and purchase the drug, because again, the library sometimes could be mislabeled. And then we do a dose response on a third set of fish, now at 12 fish per drug. If it works three times uh, in behavior, then we go on to electrophysiology assays, and each of those is done on at least a dozen fish, six, six, to, six to 12 fish. And so in, in aggregate, a drug has to work in at least four or five separate instances on probably 40 or 50 separate Dravet uh, zebrafish mutants. So it's again, it's not like a mouse experiment where we've seen an effect on three or four, three or four animals once, once or twice. We've seen this multiple times, sometimes multiple years, you know, many years later even, like Clemazole, which we've come back to time and again, and the drug is always effective. And so that's how we consider it a hit. Okay, when binding with serotonin receptors, is it acting to suppress serotonin uptake? No, so fenfluramine, a reuptake blocker, the way the synapse works is you have two sides. On one side, you're releasing the chemical, the, the neurotransmitter, and the other side it's binding to a receptor and then causing some action. So receptor agonists are, are very common in, in many types of diseases. Our drugs are receptor agonists, so they bind that kind of lock and key and they cause the other cell to do something. A reuptake blocker basically blocks the reuptake of that transmitter that's in the middle in the cleft, and so it just sticks around longer. 
And so it's going to hit all types of receptors for serotonin because it just leaves serotonin in that space longer. Uh, our drugs are not reuptake blockers, so, so they would not have the same side effects necessarily that fenfluramine might have. Okay, they just keep coming in. No, no, <laughs> I'm one. not going anywhere. So. Okay, good. Um, uh, let's see, they said, apologies if this was addressed. Any data on what seizure reduction does for cognition? I understand this is difficult to measure. Yeah, so cognition is one limitation. Uh, larval fish are you know, very young, and just like other experimental animals, it's hard to do cognitive tests on very young animals. Um, the other caveat, of course, is that we can't talk to them. And so it's very difficult to do cognitive tests on, on fish. We have not, and others in the in zebrafish field have not had much luck with adapting uh, cognitive behavioral tests to zebrafish. So we've kind of avoided that. Our comorbidity stuff um, that I kind of briefly mentioned has been ongoing for a couple of years. And so behaviors that, that are reliable, um, such as the sleep assay, and we also had um, kind of a startle assay that we do with uh, Colleen Carpenter, one of the postdocs. Uh, in those cases, clemazole is actually effective in, in eliminating the comorbidity as well. So from what we can tell in the, the few types of comorbidities we're looking at in zebrafish, um, these drugs are effective. Manisha Patel's lab has a metabolism assay, and she's also testing whether some of these drugs reverse the metabolism defects. Un unfortunately, uh, cognitive uh, uh, tests, even in rodents, are very difficult and very difficult to interpret as well. Uh, in general, in an animal model that's having a lot of seizures, they're not gonna do well on most of those cognitive behaviors, even if it's a mouse. I mean, the mouse example is they swim around in a pool and they look for a platform and they learn how to do that. Uh, a mouse not seizing is generally a lot healthier and a lot more alert. And so just stopping the seizures in mice often all, also gets them to do better on those supposed cognitive tests. And so I always have a lot of caution when trying to interpret um, whether drugs work on cognition from animal models. Um, they don't always pan out to be correlated to clinical data. And the Alzheimer's field has really played, really borne that out as well. Sorry, it's not more, I was more optimistic on that one. Um, let's see. Oh, along with that, it says, uh, what is the lifespan for zebrafish that have had seizures reduced or eliminated? Yeah, so we, we can't really, uh, uh, they still die to suit up, uh, even when they're treated with clemazole, unfortunately. Uh, we haven't found a significant difference. The fish die around 14 days of age. And so even if we treat them with low doses of any of our drugs or ketogenic diet or anything we found successful, um, I, I think partly because the sodium channel um, mutation is also maybe in the heart and there's other issues that we're not correcting that are, that are, that are unrelated to the seizures. Um, but SUDEP, again, very hard, very hard to study um, um, in animal models. Jean, okay. Greg, did, uh, did you have a question? You had your hand raised. Yes, I guess we just wanted to share our experience because it ties right into your research. Two years ago, we went to the Treve conference in Colorado, and we heard, and it changed our lives, from other parents, oh, you should try Belvique. You know, we accidentally came across it, and that's the uh, Orcaserin that you're talking about. Our son's 39 years old. He was in a group home. He's had Dervay, well, I guess from age two is when he started having seizures. He's had the best seizure control on Belvique, a diet drug. So then the FDA said, oh no, stop this, you know, on some minor percentage it caused cancer. This right. happened to us this year. And I gotta give Jean credit. She stayed after it. She got a compassionate use, reinstituted our ability to use it. And Danny, her son, is back not having seizures. Serotonin is raised by that drug also. So he smiles all the time, he's happy. So we've been really, we wanted to share that in case other parents just wanted to look into it. And Jean's always glad to help people do the discovery part too and try to help their child anyway he's 39 and the uh, the drug that you've had the most luck with has been our, and we've tried everything through the years so that's that's a positive thing for your research uh thank you that's really uh, heartwarming to hear um it's also worth pointing out uh the and the caveat i think you already know but it's worth the community knowing 
in, in the New England Journal paper that led to the FDA decision, uh, that was 12,000 uh, cardiovascular um, challenge obese patients who had a number of comorbidities and, at risk factors. And uh, the difference was 7.8% had a uh, risk of cancer versus 7.1. Um, so the FDA has allowed, you know, uh, Lorca Serin to move forward or Belvique. And, and it's worth noting that hopefully uh, Epigenetics will comment on it. We're in the process of, of generating a pediatric formulation for Lorca Serin to make it a little bit easier because I've heard from families that grinding up the tablets is not as efficient and it's hard to get the dosing. Uh, and hopefully the, the Epigenetics update can, on, the, on the commercial side can tell you more about that. Um, but it's, it's always heartwarming to hear any of this research affect anybody in your community. So thanks. Yep. He, yeah. He's on 10 milligrams right now. Twice a but, day. Um, but the thing was, the cancer differential wasn't that great. Right. And people that are on diet drugs probably are more prone to cancer anyway. Well, they're so. obese, so they're more prone to cancer. So anyway. Yeah, we, I know that paper, I've literally read it a few times. It's very, I mean, there's 12,000 uh, obese patients. There's no, there's no healthy patients in that. Well, and apparently he's part of a study now. There are about 100 in it. And Oh, wow. Yeah, that, that's what our neurologist said. They keep asking him for, for data What's because the they're, they're doing a study. Um, the manufacturer is... Esai or something? Yeah, Esai, right. So they, the reason they were able to do compassionate use is they integrated and the drug's free. It used to cost us 300 a month. Now, because he's in a study that could yield benefit for the company. Well, and because it's been pulled off the market, they can't charge for it. Okay. So uh -huh. yeah, so all the way to 2022, Danny's going to have Belvique. That's great. That's great to hear. Anyway, that's our story. We'll probably share. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. Thanks, guys. Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand raised. Thanks for that, Jenny. Um, okay, there's a couple more here. Let's see, because it keeps Anything. rolling. Um, did you find the ketogenic diet effective in these fish? Yes, we did. It's in the original 2013 publication. We did a, we raised the fish in a form of the ketogenic diet, and it was effective. And a couple of years later, Manisha Patel's lab repeated those studies uh, in an e-neuro paper. Uh, I'd be happy to direct people to the two references. But but yes, the ketogenic diet, at least as we could recapitulate it in, in, in a larval zebrafish system, was effective in suppressing seizures. And I think you answered this question already. It says on the same lines, do these uh, mutant fish grow to become adult fish? If yes, do you test the drugs that work on adults by taking the EEGs? And I think you said they don't live more than 16 days. Is that right? Right. Um, we only raise up the heterozygotes, the, the mutants die. Um, so we don't really have any data on adults. And we, wouldn't, we don't really test adult fish anyway because it's um, more complicated because they have scales and, um, and the throughput is very low. And we don't really know much about adult zebrafish as models. Okay, could SUDEP in zebrafish be indicative of what these children with Dravet syndrome might face if given these types of medicines? Um, and does a zebrafish's 14 day or 16 day lifespan correlate in any way to human years? Yeah, so it's hard to interpret, I mean, SUDEP. I, I, um, I loosely kind of say that because I know the fish die early, um, but I don't really have, I don't monitor them 24 seven. So I don't have that moment of, of sudden unexpected death. Um, and that, that, that's difficult to capture in any model. So I, I don't really, you know, be careful in saying the fish have suit up, they have early fatality. Um, the lifespan actually, um, if they were healthy, they would live two or three years. The fish would grow up and live two or three years. Um, so it's only these mutants. Um, and in fact, we've generated lots of different epilepsy fish that we'll be presenting soon for different genes. This is one of the few that actually has early fatality. Um, most of them uh, don't. Okay, it says you mentioned 5-HT2B activity as being a common characteristic among the anti-seizure medications you've tested. Do you think there's a threshold of receptor occupancy before signs of cardiac abnormal abnormalities begin to show, or do you think that additional serotonin receptors get involved? 
Yeah, that's a great question. We've been thinking about it a lot. I mean, there's some older literature that uh, to be drugs uh, were not pursued because of potential cardiovascular effects. Um, I don't know how solid that is as, as the sole mechanism of action um, for, for cardiovascular problems. The, the Lorca Serin uh, study, which was um, we talked about just a second ago on cancer, that actually was interesting because of 12,000 patients treated with Lorca Serin, they found no cardiovascular problems in that paper. And so long, um, that, that's a pretty big sampling that it's safe. The mechanism of action, um, we think it's uh, you know, obviously 2B activation. We don't know clinically what that means in terms of how much of the drug needs to bind yet. I mean, we're working on that. That's, that's a more complicated question. We do know that uh, 2A or 2C specific drugs, because we, we basically, in a recent paper, generated analogs that are either A, B, or C specific. And A and C drugs didn't show any anti-seizure activity. So that's why we think 2B is a mechanism of action. But the heart issues are certainly something we're going to keep track of. And certainly our clinical trials are carefully designed to monitor heart activity at the same time as we do these trials. I don't see any more questions um, in the chat. I got one. Actually. I got one, Misty. I'm sorry. That's fine, Ted. Go right ahead. Real quick, uh, Scott, uh, why can't you do the uh, 505B2 route for Clemazol, given that the product was on the market and there should be a lot of uh, safety data already out there? Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, Epigenics can explain more. It turns out that. Um, 1950s approved drugs don't actually have that much data. Um, and so when the FDA reviewed our, our IND requests and things and right. they offered drug designations, they, uh, uh, they, they said we can go ahead, but they suggested you know, that we get some more, uh, all that phase one and preclinical data uh, and not go that route. Um, turns out the, none of that stuff was done when the FDA used to approve drugs is what it comes down to. And the company yeah. that purchased the drug dropped it and had very little data. So we decided to just not go that route. Got it. All right. Yeah. Yeah. FDA approved is a loose term because it's yeah. a drug yeah. approved in the 1930s or 40s is very different than an FDA approved drug in 2020. Yeah. That was based upon, I think, just <laughs> safety, right? Not efficacy. Yeah. 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 And the, and the pre-studies, pre preclinical things were very limited back then. Yeah. But great question. Thank great you. Question. Sure. Looks like we have another question. Hold on one second. Yeah, okay, Let me get to the top. It's moving. Uh, okay. When you work with mice, you have a bit more control with the uptake. For example, knowing the amount you inject. However, in the zebrafish, you depend on their absorption. Does this give a lot of variability? If so, how do you tackle it? Yeah, actually, the variability in uh, larval uh, drug studies is far less than a mouse because um, you don't have metabolism issues or route of injection and things um, that are gonna, gonna kind of be uh, confluences. Um, the fish basically have no choice. They absorb whatever is in the bath. So we completely control the concentration. Um, some drugs based on their lipo lipophysity, basically how easily they can move through membranes, um, will have higher or lower concentrations in the fish. It's very hard to get an ac actual PK value or pharmacokinetic data because we can't do uh, HPLC on single larvae. Uh, in general, when, la when labs that study zebrafish and do pharmacology have looked, um, the concentration in the bath is um, very equivalent to what's inside a single fish um, for most drugs. Um, and again, we can tightly control that. Um, and we can try many fish in many different concentrations. So it's really not an issue. The, the issue that comes up is just a, a misconception that that particular number or concentration should somehow clinically translate to something. And it doesn't, and, that, and there's no reason it, it should because drugs we use in, in preclinical models don't match up with human pharmacokinetic data. Clemazole is a great example. The half-life half of Clemazole in mice, for example, was 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, which made it very hard for us to study in mice. It turned out when we did half-life experiments in our phase one clinical data trials with Clemazole in patients, it was 10 to 12 hours. And so you can see it's very hard to, to kind of take that kind of face value information from any experimental model, whether it's a fish or a mouse or whatever. Uh, I forgot an answer to the uh, age of the larvae. They're basically equivalent to early, very early developmental stages. 
as best we can we can we can judge in terms of making comparisons between different species. I don't think there are any more in the chat window. Um, there's someone thanking you for the amazing presentation. Thanks. Um, does anyone have any questions they want to ask live or out loud? And people feel free to email follow-ups. I'll be happy to answer questions if you don't want to be publicly called out on something. If, As the Dre families know, I'm very accessible. Just email me. Oh, there is one more. Um, any input on Stokes gene therapy? Any input from me? No, I don't work. I don't work with Stokes. Um, Just lots of thanks and appreciation. Yeah, that's what it <laughs> looks like. So, thanks, Mary. Um, Thank you, okay. Scott. Uh, sure. So if there are no more questions, that'll end Scott's presentation. We thank you so much for um, just coming on here today and um, sharing your knowledge with us and your findings. Um, I want to remind everyone that next Thursday at 3 o'clock, we have Lori and Carla from Zogenics joining us to talk about the sibling kits that they have. Um, just make sure you register. And that's it. Thanks, everyone. All right, you guys have a great day. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, everyone.